Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. It's really wonderful to be back here. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of time actually in this room going to various talks, uh, so, so it's really nice to have a chance to come back. Um, yeah, so for the primer, I'll do mostly board, um, but I'll show a few slides of, of pictures that's hard to draw, uh, and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Right, so, so I'll talk about some very recent work that we have on basically on this idea of how to do contrastive dimensional reduction, contrastive PCA, um, and, and hopefully that will be useful in some of your analysis in your work as well. So to set up the motivation, right, so if you're given a data set, right, so one of the, usually the first or second thing you do is to do some sort of visualization of your data set, right? So you can you know, take your data points and look at the PCA plot of it or TSNE or one of these many other dimensional reduction techniques, right? Um, and typically, if you're uh, like uh, an analyst, right? So what you're looking for is, and especially if you're expecting there to be some sort of structures in your data set, potentially clusters, what you're looking for is that when you look at the PCA, right, you're hoping to see that maybe the PCA will actually show you a few different clusters or some interesting patterns that's in your data set. Right, so this, this is a real data set from, uh, from a particular mice protein abundance analysis. Right, so if you look at this PCA, then maybe you're a little bit disappointed, right? There's no really clear clusters, no structure in this data set, right? So in contrast, right, if this is the, you know, if this is the data set you see and you see these clusters, and then you're very excited, so okay, so there's all sorts of interesting things you can do to follow up on these different clusters, right? So I think that's a pretty common, typical kind of analysis workflow. And in this case, right, so if you actually do do the downstream additional validations and analysis, you'd actually be rewarded, right? So these two clusters actually do correspond to very quite different biologies. Uh, so the actual details of data is less important here, but in this case, it corresponds to mice that have been shocked to have Down syndrome, and also um, the, the controlled healthy mice. Okay, so, so this illustrates that the, you know, the kinds of visualization, dimensional reduction you do in the beginning can have quite large impacts on the kinds of analysis you're wanting to do for the downstream analysis, right? So you're much more willing to, and much more excited to do all these follow-ups if you see the clusters, you see the patterns, um, and if you don't see the patterns in the beginning, maybe you won't even think about trying to do all these follow-up studies. So it turns out that these are actually two, they're exactly the same data set, right? So the first one is analyzed using standard PCA. The second one is analyzed using the approach that we, uh, I'll describe, that we'll call contrastive dimensional reduction or contrastive PCA, right? And, and it turns out that you can, instead of using PCA, you can use any number of other standard dimensional reduction techniques, both linear or nonlinear techniques, right? And none of them in this case is actually able to really show any interesting patterns on this mice protein abundance data set. Right. So the high level motivation or intuition for why that happens is that if you're given a data set, right, if you do any sort of standard dimensional reduction, it could be PCA or autoencoders or anything um, that you want, right, the algorithm is basically motivated or optimized to try to find patterns that explains variance in your original data set. Right, so that's very clear. Um, and if the variation in your original data set, right, the dominant variation, is really coming from non, or come from so either technical effects or biological effects that are not really of the most interest to you, then all of the standard dimensional reduction techniques will be geared towards trying to capture those variations. It's not going to show patterns that maybe that you're really interested in. Right, so why is this a problem? Is that in most biological settings, we're not really interested in the dominant patterns in a particular data set, right? Because we usually have multiple data sets, maybe one data set for my experiments and one control data set. And I'm really interested in finding patterns that are somehow really uh, you know, enriched or specific to my real data sets, my experiments that are not shared with my control, right? So that's why I want to do this contrast. I'm interested in finding these contrastive patterns. And when I'm trying to do this dimensional reduction or visualization in the beginning, I also don't want to just do PCA on my, either my real data set or somehow the combination of my control and real data sets. I, mean, I would really like to have, ideally, some sort of visualization or dimensional reduction or subspace that captures patterns that are really specific or enriched in my data set of interest that are not shared with my controls. Right. So that's the motivation for doing contrastive PCA, and I'll describe that in details. So at a high level, how the contrastive PCA works is that it takes in as input 
two data sets, right? So a sort of a, a target data set that you're interested in and a background data set that you can specify. You can choose any background you want. And they could have different number of points. They don't have to be on, even on the same set of samples, right? So it's just basically two arbitrary data sets. And the idea here is that you want your background to essentially capture whatever variation that you think is less salient for you, right? So this could be real variation, but it's not so important for you, right? And the contrast by doing this is basically going to try to capture um, really the more specific information patterns that are unique to their data set. So it's still a dimensional reduction technique. You can use it anytime you use PCA, but it's really geared towards finding these contrastive patterns. So here's just a simple cartoon of how this works, right? So imagine if I have uh, these green dots, which are, comes from my you know, target data set of interest, right? And this blue dots corresponds to some particular background data set, right? So if I do any sort of standard dimensional reduction techniques, right? So I'm going to get something that looks like this green line or this green subspace. Right, because that subspace is the one that really captures the most interesting variation across my, my target data set. Right? And if I project everything onto this green line, then you just look like the, if I project all these green dots onto that subspace, the green subspace, then you're not really going to see anything interesting. Right? Because everything, you just look like one big spectrum, one big blurb. Whereas the contrastive analysis is going to try to find this red subspace Right? Because the red subspace is the one that's the most different between uh, my target points, the blue points, and the background points, the, uh, the, the blue points. Right? Um, and if you actually project points onto the red subspace, you actually see these interesting cluster effects. Yeah. In the previous slides, QDA for drug discriminant analysis? Yes. Can you, can you give an introduction as to why QDA failed? So let me actually come back to that at the end. So, so I'll go through these methods a little bit more. But first, I want to introduce what, what we're trying to do here. Okay, other, other questions? Great. Okay, so now I'm going to actually go to the board and describe exactly what we're trying to do, but ho hopefully the high-level motivation is clear. Um, so here's the... Okay, so here's the outline. So I'm going to first just... Quick, quick overview of PCA. And then overview of contrastive. PCA. And then I'll talk about a little bit of um, some additional considerations, like how to, the choice of background. <coughs> Um, as well as how to set the contrast parameter. Okay, um, and I'll just also say that so this is really uh, very close collaboration with my two students, graduate students, Abu Bakr Abid and Martin Zhang. So they're really two fantastic students, and they led to the development of the methods. So the paper. There's a version of the paper that's already on the archive, and the codes are already available uh, with some tutorials on how to use this. Uh, and the, the official paper will actually appear next week in, uh, in Nature Communications. Okay, so to set, just to bring everyone up to speed, right? So we first want to talk about well, what does the regular PCA do? All right, so, so here's the setup. Um, okay, maybe I'll write here. Okay, so so we start with some data matrix. Right? So I have my samples, which are the rows, and the columns correspond to different features. So you have B features. So this is my X1, X2. So I assume that the columns are, are normalized, they're being centered. Right. So the intuition of regular kinds of dimensional reduction um, is that, okay, so you know, I have, if I just plot the rows, I have a bunch of these points. Right. So this is x1, x2. Right. So there are points in this d-dimensional space. 
And essentially, I'm trying to solve the following kind of optimization problem. Right? So we want to solve the principal component to x over vectors, you know, unit vectors, such that when you project onto that unit vector v, you maximize the variance explained. which can also be written as right. So this is basically how you get the first principal component. Right. Um, and this is basically variance of x explained by b. Okay. So so this is how the regular PCA works, right? Um, so I'll, I'll basically illustrate everything with the simplest PCA, but all of this can also be extended to nonlinear versions like kernel PCA, nonlinear dimensional reduction. Okay, so um, good, and then, so the setting we're working with is that you have also have some background data set, right? Let's call this W. This is your background. So you can have different number of points, right? So the row, number of rows are different. Um, so they could come from different samples, right? So in general, you can you have a lot of flexibility in choosing what background you want. The key here is just you know the background really should capture some sort of variation, like you don't really care about. So that could be some control data set. Um, and then what we're interested in is that for the same direction v, right? So here I have the variance of x as explained by v. I can also compute the variance of w that's explained by v, right? This is just, it's also very simple. Variance of w explained by v is, um, right, again, so the, 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 the picture here is really, is this my x that I'm gonna try to find this subspace V here, right? So what this is doing is that I'm just going to essentially project everything onto this subspace V and then compute what is the, after I do the projection, essentially the square distance, right? From all the projected points uh, onto the subspace V. So that's exactly what the variance explained is. And that's exactly what this formula here is showing, right? So if I have a different data set, W, I can also, for the same direction, again, do this projection and compute the variance explained. Right, makes sense. Okay, so then, um, given this setup, right, so then I want to, the goal here is to find right, so the goal here is to, I want to find some subspaces <laughs> such that the variance explained, x ex explained is large in some sense that I'll explain, and variance of w explained is small. Right, so that's my operational definition of what it means to find a good contrast. Right. So again, the variances could be on different scales, so I have to be a bit more precise of what I mean by large and small, but intuitively, this is what cap this is captures what we try to do in the beginning, right? Okay, does this make sense so far? Okay, so now let's be a little bit more precise of what it means to, uh, how to operationally do this, right? So, and to define this more mathematically precisely, I want to sort of draw a picture um, here, right. So for each of my unit vectors, right, in d-dimensional space, I can compute two quantities, which is the variance explained by 
of x and the variance of what variance of x explained by b and the variance of w that's explained by b. Right, so that gives me two numbers. I can always do this. So basically for every point, for every unit vector, I'm going to map it onto this two-dimensional space just for purely for mathematical reasons. Right, so this the x-axis is just the the y-axis is So it turns out that this unit circle is going to correspond to you know, some region that looks like this. Right. So again, each V is mapped to a particular point here. Uh, and the X and Y coordinates correspond to the variance explained of my two data sets. Right. So geometrically, what do you think is actually a good V here? So if I tell you that this whole region will um, Right, so, so this entire circle maps this whole region. What do you think would, would actually be a good choice of uh, contrast subspace V? Yeah. The lower right-hand corner? Yeah, yeah, so, so that's a good point, right? So, <laughs> right, so if you are somehow at the lower right corner here, right, so that's, if you're on this boundary, right, that means that you have um, maximized the variance of x explained, you can't really go right anymore, and you have minimized the variance of w explained. You can't go down anymore, right? So, but it turns out that um, there's just like a whole, let me use a different color. So essentially there's the, this um, segment, like basically like a Pareto frontier, of this lower right corner where you're essentially basically all at the boundary, right? So any of these points um, could also be, could all be very good, right? So and each of those points on this boundary corresponds to a different subspace, right? But each of them will have the property that you cannot really, uh, uh, no, so it's somehow like a Pareto frontier in the sense that you cannot uh, strictly increase X or decrease W. Yes. You've drawn that as convex. Is it, is it actually convex? Yes. Yeah. So it turns out that this 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 is actually a convex space, uh, and we have proofs of that in the paper. Okay. So so the idea here then is that with this geometric picture, right, the natural thing we want to do is to we want to find exactly this segment, right, this red segment, because that if we can find that segment, that corresponds to all of the directions, all of the subspaces that are, you know, maximally contrasted. Right, and that's just a general phenomenon for all data sets. So what I'll do is I'll give you a very simple algorithm that mathematically is guaranteed to find exactly that segment, and that's what we call our contrastive PCA. Okay, so it's a super simple algorithm, so let me show you how that works. Um, okay, so, so remember the intuition for the original PCA is right. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to solve this optimization problem. Right. We're just really trying to find the direction that maximizes uh, you know, the projection onto that subspace. Okay. So I'm going to solve a very simple but like, analogous optimization problem, which is the following. So the contrastive. I'm going to denote this by CPC. It's going to come from. Again, over unit vectors. Okay. So basically all that I've done is essentially the, the simplest thing you can think of, right? I have two data sets now, right? So to try to find the contrast, I'm simply going to say find the direction so that you know, with some parameter alpha that's fixed, right? So that the projections of my original data sets onto V is uh, minus the projections of my, of my background data set W onto V, the difference is, is large. Right, for the fixed setting parameter alpha. Uh, 
So it turns out that this is basically, so to solve this, it just corresponds to taking the first eigenvector, which you could compute. So this is exactly, also corresponds to solving the eigenvector problem. You are essentially trying to solve uh, the eigenvector, so this is equivalent, equals to B, Right, so you essentially form this new matrix, which is, in some sense, the, the covariance matrix of X, subtract off the covariance matrix of W, of your background, right, with some contrast parameter alpha, and, um, and you just try to find the eigenvector of that. Right, so it's as simple as the original PCA, computationally. And the, the theoretical guarantee is that the set of contrast directions Right. Contrastive directions equals to solving this optimization problem. Equals to solving, it's exactly the same as solving this CPC for alpha partial equal to zero. Right, so basically, you think of alpha as being your tuning parameter for the contrast. So you start with zero and you increase it. Basically, if you increase it from zero to larger and larger alphas, that will exactly trace out the boundaries of this, of this curve that I've drawn here. Yes? So it's computationally equivalent to PCA. And I agree, if you compute the correlation matrix and then do symmetric eigen composition, it's but can you do an SVD approach? Like that doesn't that that correlation matrix is not orthogonal. Your data sets aren't orthogonal, so you can't decompose that combined correlation into a, a gram matrix in its own right. So is does SVD not go through here in the context where you have say a small number of features and a huge number of samples? Yeah, so, 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 that's, so that's a good question, and I'll come back to this more, but basically what happens is that if you have, for one setting of alpha, right, if you fix a particular alpha, then we can show that this is, you can always use all the same SVD techniques to solve for this problem, right? So what perhaps you're getting at is that now there's still the harder computational problem, you still have to sweep out different values of alpha, right? and for different values of alpha, essentially the subspaces of, uh, of this object, this contrastive covariance matrix is no longer the same, right? So I cannot just simply do SVD once and then get everything for free, right? So yeah, so, so that's a very good point and I'll address how we uh, computationally solve this uh, in, in, in this part here. Yes? So it sounds like the, your theorem that contrast, contrastive directions uh, are found by solving this problem? What, what do you mean by contract, contrastive directions in that case? Like, what's the equivalence there? Yeah, so, so I didn't define it formally, but I just mean the contrastive directions are exactly this line segment here, this Pareto frontiers. So let me, so yeah, let me actually use the same color to make it clear. Or the, the pre-image on the circle that corresponds to that frontier? That's right. Yeah, so, so we can define that formally, but it just requires a little bit more notations. Yeah, uh, but at least I hope that geometric intuition is clear to people, right? I mean, in some sense, we agree it's natural that if you can find directions V that maps onto this frontier, then that's, uh, in some sense, like a very good contrasted direction, right? Uh, and what this theorem says is that if you run this algorithm for different values of alpha larger than zero, then you'll find exactly the directions V that corresponds to this red line segment that will find you all of the contrast of the directions. Okay, so here's just a sanity check. Right, so if alpha equals to zero, then you have uh, basically just a regular PCA, right? So, so as you, over, you always recover the regular PCA, but as you increase your alpha, then you can get something that could be quite different. Other questions? <laughs> 
So, so, so I think it's also maybe useful for your intuition to think about the other extreme, right? So if alpha equal to zero corresponds to the one extreme where essentially I don't want any contrast. I only care about explaining the patterns, the variation in my original data set X, then the, my standard dimensional reduction techniques, such as PCA, is the best thing I can do because they're designed to solve that problem. Right, so what happens in the other extreme when alpha becomes very large? What do you think would happen? Right, so in some sense, when alpha becomes very large, it's also, uh, it's really not so interesting to us, right? Yes, when alpha becomes very large, then it's saying, okay, I don't care at all about any patterns in X. I just want to find some subspace in W in my background data set that essentially has no variation in W, right? So, in, so that could just be some very noisy subspace that, for whatever reason, has very little variation in my background. Right, so again, it doesn't really capture what, um, what the interesting patterns in, in X. Right, so the part of the, the trade-off here is that ideally for visualization data exploration purposes, um, right, we want to find relatively simple settings of alpha, small settings of alpha, or we, trade -off, we can capture interesting patterns in, in my original data set that's not shared with my background without getting dominated by the background. Okay, so, um, so that's all I want to say about the, the algorithms, right? So the algorithm is, um, oh, okay, maybe I'll just write down the pseudocode for the algorithm is, right? So the algorithm, So can people still see if I write here? Okay. So, so you start with some um, input data sets. So, X and W, my, your choice of your target and your background data sets. Right. Um, and then we'll have some automated ways to choose essentially a range of alphas. Right. So, so I'll, I'll describe how that's done. So we have a, a range of basically a set of alphas of uh, contrast parameters. And then for each one, we simply do um, solve for the eigen vector of View, and then the output is uh, the set of these directions correspond to these alphas. So the alphas. Okay. So so there's a couple. Of, um, so so that's the generic algorithm, right? Um, so to run this in practice, to make it useful you know, for your analysis in practice, then there are basically two things to consider, right? So what's your choice of how do you choose a good background data set? And then how do you try to find uh, good settings for the contrast? So the choice of the background data set is something that you have to do with your domain knowledge. We try to automate the process of finding the contrast. So for the background data sets, I mean, I think it really depends on the specific applications, right? But here are some just general tech settings where I think it makes sense to think about using this, using, for choosing particular choices of W for the background, all right? So in the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning example where we have the, the mice proteins, right? So if you actually have uh, some control data sets from a control experiment, then that, that makes a natural choice for your background, which is exactly what we did with the, the mice proteins, which is simply used a different set of mice that, um, that, was, uh, that was the control mice. And if you do the contrast there, then that auto immediately reveals these two clusters. Um, if you have time series analysis, right, maybe it makes sense to use you know, a previous time point, time point zero as your background, and then later time points, time point one as your target, as your X. Right, if you do that, then 
the contrastive analysis, you're going to try to find patterns that are enriched or specific in your later time points that are not shared with your earlier time points. Right, or if you're doing some sort of treatment analysis, maybe you want to do your post-treatment as your X, your pre-treatment as your background controls. Right? So it depends on your applications. I think, I think it's quite, um, it should be relatively natural to find interesting choices of your background. Um, okay, so, so here's kind of another fun application uh, from genetics, right, just to illustrate how one might use to choose, choose this background. So this comes from a data set that, um, that I think actually my colleague Carlos Pustamante in his lab analyzed. Um, so they collected uh, SNPs, genetic information, from individuals of five different states in, in Mexico. Right. So a lot of you have probably seen these you know, famous analysis where if you try to, try to do PCAs on using genetics data, they would like to have the projections onto the principal components to somehow capture different parts of the geography. Right. So it turns out that it's actually very hard to do in this data set. Right. So if you basically, if you take the genetic SNPs, and if I just run the regular PCs here, here I'm coloring the five colors corresponds to the five geographic states, then things are just, it's all a blurb. Right. And the reason for this is that when you look at the Mexican individuals here, right, so a large part of their genome is dominated by, by uh, European ancestries. Right, so essentially what's happening with the, the principal components is that it's really capturing the variation that comes from how much European ancestry do you have in each of these individuals. It's not capturing, it's, that's the dominant patterns. Right? It's not capturing how much uh, uh, you know, Mexican geography is really contributing to the, to, the, to the ancestry, which is what we're interested in finding. Right? And that's not really... Um, something you say, oh, the PCA didn't work, right? The PCA is doing what it's supposed to do, which is capturing the dominant patterns, which just in this data set is dominated by, by something that we don't really care about. Um, so, so what do we do with the contrast PCA, right? So for the contrast PCA, here it's also very simple, right? So we say, oh, okay, um, I know that I'm less interested in variations along European axis, Right, so for my background data sets, I'm just simply going to create a set of individuals of Mexicans and Europeans. I right, just take Europeans from the thousand genome, and then that's my background data set. Right, so the background then is going to capture, it's going to be dominated by patterns, by variation between Mexicans and Europeans, which is exactly the pattern that I don't want, I don't care about, I want to remove from my foreground analysis. Right, so again, uh, so that's all we do. Uh, the actual setting of the contrast is also automated, so there's really no tuning here. Then this is what we get, right? Uh, and you get something still not perfect, but I think that's a much better job at capturing really the fine-grained geographies in these populations, right? Um, so the so the, the colors here in the in the map, uh, we match it with the colors of the of the in, uh, of the individuals where they come from. You can see that basically you have sort of similar mappings of the of the the individuals when you do the contrast of principal component analysis. Right, so that's just a simple example of, you know, it, so I think it's quite a general tool, but if you just think a little bit about what you might, what, what are the kinds of variations that you would like to contrast away, then you can easily design and find background data sets and immediately get potentially much more powerful analysis and results. Yes? I was wondering if you could, uh, say anything about how this, maybe use of this tool would be different from something like discriminant analysis, which should be, I assume, directly looking at the differences between those subpopulations. Okay, perfect. So let me actually jump into, uh, so, so the question is the level where I, sh I should be paying you to ask those questions. <laughs> um, so let me actually jump here, right? So, so okay, so I'm gonna show you a data set, right? Um, another data set where it's actually a much harder data set, right? So if you do any kind of analysis, standard analysis, just on the data set itself, it's all going to look like, so there are actually four clusters, but all the clusters are going to be blurred, right? Um, and in particular, so here we run all these things, linear and nonlinear things. Um, so, so you're also going to, none of them is actually able to separate out these four clusters. And the reasons of that, uh, I think one of them is actually discriminant, linear discriminant analysis, and we also have quadratic discriminant analysis here. 
right? So, and the reason for this is that if you actually simply do the discrimination, right, then the goal is actually very different. The discrimination doesn't really care about how much patterns in the foreground data set it explains. It just cares about, it's optimized for finding some decision boundary or subspace that just distinguishes your foreground, your target from your background data. Right? So that's also going to lose potentially important subtle patterns that's in the, in the, in the target data set. Right? Because it's, it's, its goal is not to preserve those patterns, its goal is just simply try to do, do a, you know, a separation between your, for, your, your target and your background. Right, so the contrastive analysis here what you're doing is very different, right? So we're, we don't think of this as being a supervised learning task. It's still essentially an unsupervised learning task because the goal here is to really try to do visualizations, explorations of the patterns that are specific to your target data set, right? So we're not trying to learn any decision boundaries. All that we're trying to do is to essentially contrast away information from the background. Yes? Dig into that a little more. You say patterns that are uh, <coughs> unique to the target data set, but it seems like in your example with genetics, you didn't choose to take a European, a purely European data set as your background, right? You took a European data set, a data set that was part European and part Mexican, because yeah. this would really draw out the variation that exists in the Mexicans due to the European, due to the proportion of European ancestry. That's right. And, and so it's not that you're looking for patterns that are unique to your target data set. You're looking for patterns that exist in both, but that are sort of more dominant in your target data set. Yeah, so... Because I, if you wanted unique, you'd set alpha to infinity. Yeah, so... Yeah, so so, I th so that's a good point, right? So what's... I think what I said in the beginning, and I should, should be careful with this, is that we were trying to look for patterns that are enriched in my target data set compared to my background data set, right? So for the... So exactly... The well, you said so for the analysis is more to, akin to the alpha infinity analysis. Is that yeah? So it turns out that even if you set alpha to infinity, that's not the same as discriminative analysis, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 that's a good point, right? So when you're constructing the background, you're really really thinking. You have to think about what is the variation that you care less about, right, in your target data compared to your background. Right? So in this case, I don't really care about the Mexican to European variation. That's why I can be fairly cavalier in constructing like a background data set. Right? Uh, and, uh, and it turns out to be quite robust. Right? So I can use, instead of using Dyson genome, I can use some other things. The number of individuals I choose in my background is also fairly robust to that. Okay, so I have... Um, about, yeah. about this slide. So what's the um, background data set and what's labeled? Like your four clusters, you don't know that there are four clusters? Yeah, yeah, so, so let me explain this data set a little bit more. So, so I jumped to this without explaining it. Okay. Right. So, um, so, this is a, this, so this is actually a synthetic data set, right? So we created quite a hard synthetic data set we want to use to just to illustrate how well would the, our algorithms for finding the different contrast parameters work in very, in very hard settings. So first, let me explain how do we actually find the contrast parameters alpha. So essentially what we do, um, it's also a very simple approach. So essentially, we compute a few values of alpha along this grid. Right? So it turns out what happens is that for most values of alpha, right, it's essentially capturing the same subspace. Right? It's maybe rotating it a little bit, but it's not really getting anything different. Right? So then what we do is we compute the principal angles between you know, successive values of alpha, right, to capturing how much is your subspace actually changing. So based on the principal angles, we essentially do a clustering of the different values of alpha for different contrast to find essentially where the phase transitions are happening. Right. So I think I don't have too much time, so I'll maybe I'll leave. The, so I can go through the details of that algorithm for finding the alpha um, a little bit more at the end during questions if there's questions about that. But essentially, the automated procedure is just we try a, a, a grid of values of alpha, and essentially we cluster those values of alpha based on their principal angles between those subspaces to find what are the most uh, representative uh, and different subspaces to look for. So this synthetic data set, as we said, is created so that um, uh, it's 
there are actually four clusters. So it's generated from a mixture of four Gaussians. Right, so there are these different, uh, so it's a very simple mixture of four Gaussians colored by these four points here. Right, but the four Gaussians are such that, and it's in fairly high dimensional space, so that um, the variation within the Gaussian um, along some dimensions are also quite large compared to the variation across the Gaussians. Right, so what this means is that if you actually do any principal component analysis, right, it doesn't have to be the first two PCs, it could be PCs two or three, three and five, none of them is actually able to distinguish between, between these four Gaussians, right? And, and that's also a mathematical fact that we can prove. So, what the, so here I'm showing you basically, so, so by default, the contrasted PCA is going to report to you four different values of alpha, right? It does a cluster, you know, clusters all the different values into four groups and reports those four values. So it always reports alpha to zero because that's the regular PCA. And here are the three different values of alpha that it, that it automatically reports. Right, so, um, and what's interesting about this data set is that, so there are essentially three types of dimensions, right? Along one set of dimensions, essentially the red and black dots are aligned, and the blue and green dots are aligned, right? That's in the first block of dimensions. The second block of dimensions is swapped so that the red and blue dots are aligned, and the black and green dots are aligned. And then, and then there are some dimensions where there are, there are all four of them are different. Right? So what we want to see here is that actually just by doing this contrast, we're able to automatically identify all four of the interesting regimes where the clusters are, um, where we show different clustering patterns. Right? So, so, so this is a, you know, a fairly naive toy example, but it sort of wants to illustrate the point of how you can find different uh, subspaces of interest. Yes? What was, what was your background for this? Ah, good, yeah, so the background for this is we simply take uh, the Gaussians, basically another set of Gaussians that are generated from the same distribution, but where the, uh, so essentially another set of Gaussians where there's no uh, variation along those directions. Right, because the, the idea here is that what makes it what makes a standard principal component that's hard to distinguish those particular dimensions is that the noise variation, right, in general, just due to the Gaussianness, is going to dominate, right, because you're in fairly high dimensional space, right? But when you take a background data set that just come from the same Gaussians, right, then those, those uh, variations, the large variations you see are no longer the contrastive dimensions, right? They're no longer interesting. And then when you do that, then that makes it much better for the algorithm to reveal these fine-grained differences. Yes? Why would quadratic discriminant analysis fail? Yeah, so let's see here. Let me see, so I think QDA, yeah, so this is the quadratic discriminant analysis here on the same data set, right? So, um, I mean, it's essentially still solving, it's still solving a very different objective, right? Because it's still trying to find, I mean, it's, similar to the LDA, right? So it's still trying to find discrimination directions. In this case, it could be a nonlinear decision, right? But still, it's not, doesn't really care about trying to capture the patterns that's in my original data set, right? So the idea here is that if you try to really frame this as a purely discrimination problem, like a supervised learning problem, then you are going to miss the fine-grained patterns in your original data sets of interest, because that's not what the, the classifier, what the discriminator is trying to do. Do we stop at 45 after? Okay, okay, okay great. Yeah, so um, why don't I stop here and then make sure I take some more questions. The correct way we don't know the color, so we don't know the group. So how do you know which alpha is the correct one or separating the groups? You don't know which group are. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so here I'm just, so you're right. So in practice, I don't know the colors, right? So that's why we, the, the automated algorithm is gonna spit out back to you four values of alpha. That's the default version of the algorithm. Um, and here, so imagine, so blur your eyes, imagine you don't see these colors, right? So all you, that you see is that, okay, so here you have these four groups, and here maybe you have these two groups, right? Um, and the point is that if you actually look at those groups and then go in and do additional analysis, then you would have found that these are actually two, four distinct groups, right? So, 
Um, I mean, as with any sort of visualization data exploration tool, the, the goal of this is to try to reveal what are the, you know, the intrinsic patterns in the data sets. You don't know the ground truth. In this case, we do because we generated the, 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 the data sets, but you can just go in and then figure out that these four clusters are actually the real clusters. And if in reality there are only two groups, we will not have seen those four groups in the alpha before. So, so in reality, there are four groups here. The ground truth is that there are four clusters, right? Um, and the, so the algorithm can identify settings of the contrast where it correctly reveals the four clusters. So similarly with the original data set I mentioned, like the, the mice protein data set, right? So that's also, uh, we didn't tune it, so just using the automated choice of the alphas. Right, so there, it also identifies the two clusters corresponds to the Down syndrome mice and the, the healthy mice. Um, in that case, we also know the ground truth because we have additional experiments, right? But the point is that if you didn't have additional experiments, then you do want to know that there are these two clusters in your data set. Yes? If there are no clusters in your data set, uh, will, it, will it reveal that there is, in fact, no clusters, or yes. is it? Sort yeah, of so, yeah, that's right. So, so we can actually show that if your data set is actually not, there's no interesting clusters or just noise, then the algorithm will just, for all the values of alpha, it will still just show you uh, no clusters. Yeah, so, it, it, um, so it's quite robust against that kind of false positives. Other questions? What can we use, for example, when doing like a fast correction or something, want to go in RS expression, if there's difference between two different data flows, two different maps or something. So we should be able to find if groups or not in that case, right? Yeah, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think those are good settings. Um, I guess I would suggest that basically any settings where you're using regular PCA or using regular dimension reduction techniques, and if you have some some sort of background data sets that you, you know, you can easily use, which often is the case. Then it's just as easy to run this algorithm and then see what uh, what contrasts, what additional contrasted patterns do you pick up.